do you really want to give the international investors the perception that you are doing this SFZ is to try to align interests with one particular country? Hi guys, welcome to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about politics and public policies in ways that are relevant to you, our loyal subscribers, and also many who watch but haven't liked and subscribed yet. So thank you so much uh, to all our uh, supporters. Uh, we've reached over 25,000 subscribers already. I yep. think uh, that's a pretty good achievement. Yay! <laughs> so, but uh, we also know that many of you watch uh, this on a regular basis and perhaps even mm. uh, watch uh, the couple of uh, recent episodes involving Dr. Jason Leong. That's right. Uh, and also when we talked about Charlie in Penang, uh, you know, that, that was uh, more than 100,000 views. Oh, uh, but yeah. You haven't subscribed yet. So please like and subscribe so that we can continue to bring great content to you on a regular basis and also bring in uh, more guests. So on this note, Peter, I wanted to ask you, right, uh, on your Mr. Money channel, do you remember how long did it take for you to reach uh, 100,000 subscribers? Oh, it took me close to three years. Three years. Close to three years. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So when you reached that milestone, what was your feeling like? Oh, that really felt great. Yeah, finally you feel like you are, oh, wow. Being in the niche topic, you managed to cross 100,000 in the Malaysia, such a small country. Mm. Exciting, very excited, and you feel a sense of achievement. Hopefully, we won't take three years or nearly three years to reach 100,000 Oh, I think it's going to be way faster. <laughs> way faster. <laughs> Based uh, on what I see, I think uh, at most, uh, maybe two years. Uh, two years. Uh, okay, okay. So, until next years, December, two we, full years, we give uh, ourselves that target. Maybe the next target to aim for is uh, 30,000 subscribers. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we're yep. almost there. Uh, we're about... 25,700 already. So please uh, like and subscribe to our content. And also, I know from the feedback uh, that you guys also highlighted the fact that the mic for our guests in the Picha segment, in the mm. Picha episode, and also with Dr. Jason Leong, uh, the, the, the sound wasn't so great. Did, did something happen to the mixer, Peter? Yes, there was uh, some technical errors. Apologies to you guys. Uh, apologies to Dr. Jason and also uh, to Suzanne Ling of uh, Picha. But yeah, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that that doesn't happen again. So, um, Peter, what have you been doing lately, you know, over the past week? Any interesting things? So, aside from the typical busyness, uh, I picked up a new skill. I started learning how to play chess. What happened was that, you know, as usual, I read a lot of business books. I read a lot of uh, things and I thought to myself, I was also looking at some of the, the, the different kind of websites in the market and studying some business models. So I came across this podcast that talked about chess.com, which okay. again, is similar to us, niche, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about particular knowledge and mm -hmm. then you want to encourage people to get good at it. And in my case, it would be financial, current issues, you know, stuff like that. So I thought it was their business model. like So I started studying it and I started using it. Then I tried to run through their, their syllabus mm. and I realized that, it actually chess teaches you a lot about business. From what perspective? Like the strategy or... That's right. Okay. Yeah. So like um, I, I used to just look at the chess board and I don't know what to do. It's just by feeling. Uh. Then how they describe it. Like, oh, you want to place your thing, your pieces at the right place to create a strategy. Uh. Then only you go into the tactical attacks, okay, right? Okay. And so all this start to make sense to me. Okay. Where, for example, you conquer the center of the chessboard because there's more options. You don't mm. go to the corner because mm -hmm. it gives you less options. Mm. And sometimes you just want to develop certain pieces, you mm. know, stuff like that. And and it surprisingly, it helped me in my meetings. Because ah. when, I, when I have my meetings with my team, subsequently, when I tried to describe things to them, mm. I was able to organize it better as well. Mm. Like why we make certain moves, it may not be, it may not look like there's an immediate benefit, but you mm. may want to, uh, the long term, mm. why do you place it there mm. so that it kind of... Yeah, the bishop controls certain diagonals. Yes. Yeah, then the, the, the knight is strategically placed in an outpost. Yes, that's yeah. right. So, so I kind of got into it a little bit more to more for business purpose and kind of to find out what am I good and not good at as well. Yeah, so um, as for myself, I've been doing a bit of traveling. I was in uh, Hong Kong, uh, my first trip to Hong Kong post-pandemic mm. for about four days uh, for a business conference. So, so be before you share with me, uh, what do you do there, right? How is the situation in Hong Kong like, right? Uh, is, it, is it more quiet than last time pre-pandemic? You know, I remember it used to be very hustling, bustling, mm. everyone very noisy. And then apparently a lot of people left Hong Kong in a sense. Mm. And now it's a little bit more quiet. Do you really feel that in the street? I got the sense that 
not so many expatriates around uh, uh. compared to before, uh, definitely before the pandemic. Now, maybe some of them are slowly coming back, but I think quite a number have decamped to Singapore already. Mm, okay. Uh, at the same time, the city center, some of the more popular places, uh, still got quite a lot of tourists. Uh, drop by the you know uh, Hong Kong MRT station where this uh, international finance center is located, and then uh, uh, Central as well, Zhongwan. Mm. So quite crowded. Uh, but uh, when you know where I stayed was a little bit on the outskirts, uh, that was a little bit quieter. And right. from my discussions with some of my friends there, basically the retail sector is quite cool because Ooh. many Hong Kongers uh, and uh, maybe other long term stayers in Hong Kong they actually go to Shenzhen to do their weekend shopping and things mm. like that because it's so convenient. Uh, you know they go there to buy stuff and it's like one third the cost. Right, right. which made which made me think of the situation that could happen in Singapore and also Johor Bahru, mm. which is already happening now. That's right. If let's say the RTS comes and then also passport uh, free travel is introduced, uh, you may find a situation in Singapore whereby uh, Orchard Road and those tourist places are still quite happening because of the overseas tourists. But some of the periphery, you know, people who are living in uh, Woodlands, Punggol, they may find it so convenient to go to Singapore to do mm. shopping that the retail sector in those places uh, may be a little bit affected. Right, I see. Yeah. yeah so b before we go into that part, right, uh, like more in depth, maybe we can talk about it because recently you have just been uh, officially appointed by the think tank at Jacob there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, this is called a uh, Cerebrum, a think tank that was established by uh, Jacob, the um, you know corporate arm of the Joe State Government. Mm. So my role is to uh, try to see how this uh, think tank, uh, you know, give advice uh, to this think tank so that they can play uh, an important role in terms of doing the thinking and doing with regards to the Joho corporate and intellectual ecosystem. Mm, yeah, and you also wrote an article on The Age, which uh, over the weekend I saw, I was like, eh, can we get an article out, right? Yes, uh, this was yeah. uh, talking about industrial parks, parks world-class industrial parks. This was based on my sharing at the UEM Sunrise Real Estate Forum, right? Mm. So this is... You know, different you know, pieces of the puzzle uh, falling in together. And right, this right. is part and parcel of the larger conversation about the GSSEZ. Right. So uh, before you share with us that, yeah. So what were you doing in Hong Kong, actually? Uh, I was there for a conference <laughs> talking about recent topic that I have uh, been finding out more about, which is BRICS+. Plus. Ah, B -R -I -C -S. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. That's yeah. exciting. Looking at the digital economy perspective from, from, you know, because I'm writing a piece on that. And one of the things that I found out during my research is that the membership of BRICS has already been expanded. Uh, you know, I'm not sure whether our audience knows as well. To include uh, countries uh, like Egypt. Uh, you're talking about also Ethiopia. Iran and UAE, mm. right? And the last one is a question mark. We're not quite sure whether Saudi Arabia has officially joined or not, mm. right? Because uh, initially China did invite the both uh, both these countries, China, and, uh, Iran, and uh, Saudi Arabia to join BRICS. But later, I think because of some pushback from the Americans, quietly from behind the scenes, the, the Saudis are having second thoughts. But anyways, mm. you know, this is a topic that I'm gonna be sharing and talking more about in the in the future, especially since mm. Malaysia has made its intention known on one thing to join BRICS. Yeah, we should actually do a topic covering on this, probably the next episode or something like that, right? Uh, yes, and we may bring in a special guest, uh, maybe an academic who is well-versed in this issue uh, to share uh, his or her thoughts on this. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, so after Hong Kong, you know, a couple of uh, days, days there, four, four or five days, I came back, made a short trip to Penang, uh, you know, because uh, I was giving a presentation to, to a regional bank there, uh, and then came back uh, yesterday, day trip to Johor. Mm. I was there in uh, JB for the Invest Malaysia event that took place in Iskandar Putri. So it, Invest Malaysia is an annual event uh, that is organized by Bursa Malaysia, supported by a couple of uh, major banks. Uh, in this case, it was Maybank, CIMB, uh, as well as HSBC. Mm. Uh, and uh, all the, quite a number of our uh, Glick CEOs were there as well, including Kazana, uh, EPF, Ooh. Coop, uh, as well as LTAT. Uh, so it's, it's a big event and this is the first time they were holding it in uh, Johor, right? Uh, and of course, you can guess uh, one of the reasons why they chose Johor uh, because of the JSSEZ. Right, yeah. right. PM was there. Minister of Economy Rafizi was supposed to be there to have a fireside chat. But unfortunately, he was taken ill. Uh, so he couldn't be there to answer questions about GSSEZ. Uh, I would have uh, definitely thrown in a question about PADU <laughs> and uh, petrol subsidies. But that may have to wait until Maybe he knew you were there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm not, I'm, I'm not that important. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were other uh, people that were far more important than me. But I was there as a panelist uh, giving my views on some of the things that will make the GSSEZ more interesting. Mm. Uh, but I thought maybe for the first segment, I wanted to bring up 
uh, and uh, the issue and discuss the issue of the um, special financial zone mm. uh, because those incentives for the special financial zone that's going to be located at Forest City uh, was announced by the second finance minister mm. just um, uh, you know a few days before the Invest Malaysia event that was officiated by the Prime Minister. That's right. Right. So, uh, w- were you aware of some of the buzz that was going on? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in fact, at the moment, we heard about that. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, our CFO, actually sent us uh, the details about it. Yeah, And we were making a joke that maybe we should apply to go there under the financial education ah. segment and see whether there's such thing or not. Then yes. we go down there and set up shop. So the details, I think, are not fully fleshed out yet uh, because we need further clarity from Bank Negara in yep. terms of how these uh, uh, special incentives are going to uh, you know, materialize. Uh, some that have been announced includes, for example, um, 0% tax for family offices that are going to be established there. Uh, also, you know, lower tax rates for professionals in the financial industry that are employed out of uh, entities that are set up or incorporated in the SFZ. Mm. Uh, and then also other uh, tax incentives that were in- announced for uh, these entities. La, right? So mm. I think uh, some interest, some buzz, uh, but I thought that, my, my, my personal opinion, it would have probably been better if those announcements were made when PM was officiating the Invest Malaysia event. Mm. Uh, the reason is this, because when you are at an event like this where you get all, uh, many people in the um, uh, fund management industry, whether it's local or international, uh, coming there, you have all these click heads there, you have all the bank CEOs there. Uh, you expect the Prime Minister to make an announcement that is at least newsworthy, mm. right? Uh, but you know his speech, the official part actually was just the last five minutes. La. Before that, it was his uh, sort of like a more stream of consciousness thoughts on one or two topics, including AI, that were maybe not so relevant to the to the topic at hand. Uh, and at the end of the day, no big announcement, right? So again, maybe just pulling you guys behind the curtain. Uh, the announcement that was made about the SFZ was made at Forest City itself. Mm. Uh, and from sort of like a triangulation standpoint, the dates also coincided with the visit of the Sultan of Johor, which is our Agong, to China. Mm, right? So yes. that happened on the 20th of September, uh, last Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Right? So when analysts, uh, people in the financial sector and otherwise, they put these things together, what do you think would be some of the conclusions that they, they would come up with? I think that if you put the dates together and the timing together, it kind of says that the main backer behind this whole thing, the one, the first initiative flow of money coming in will be from uh, China. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how it feels like, like at least. Uh, or maybe yeah. uh, something that you're doing uh, to signal your alignment with uh, the Agong, uh, because the Tunku Matukota Johor, the, 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 the crown prince uh, and the acting sultan was also there. Mm. Uh, at, as, as the guest of honor uh, at the announcement. Uh, and, you know, that kind of timing seems to indicate that, you know, you want to signal to the king and also to China that this is something that we want your cooperation on. Or yeah. you know, at least uh, we are signaling to you that this is something that we're doing to revive Forest City. That's right. But, you know, I want to take a contrarian view on this, uh, which is the following. Do you really want to give the international markets, uh, international investors, the perception that you are doing this SFZ, one of the reasons la, is to try to align interests with one particular country. Yeah, Because that, that can be tricky. That's right. Yes, yeah. because you know when you want to have these family offices, you want to uh, get them from different parts of the world, maybe from the Middle East, from China, from Hong Kong, from other parts of Southeast Asia. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and uh, you, you also have to know that we probably won't be able to compete head-on with uh, Singapore. That's right. right. So we are sort of like uh, complementing what Singapore is doing. Uh, and, you know, you do not want to send the signal, I think, that this is uh, a China-backed project. That's one. Second thing is, you're trying to revive Forest City. Yes, we know that this is a project by a Chinese uh, contractor, mm. right? Um, Country Garden. But like we said in one of our previous episodes, when we talked about the possibility of there being a Korea town in uh, Forest right. City, right? It's, it would actually be better if we move away from the perception that this is a Chinese project, mm. right? We want to internationalize Forest City. We want to make it into a special financial zone. Mm. Uh, and having this kind of alignment and having that date of announcement 
and tying it so closely with the Sultan of Johor may not necessarily be good from an optics perspective. Uh, my uh, own uh, view is that PM should have saved that announcement for the special financial zone for the Invest Malaysia event. Mm. And that would have captured the headlines. That would have shown that uh, he is talking to international investors. Mm, that's right? true. Uh, rather than just focusing on uh, you know, signaling to you know, a specific community using uh, SFZ to time it together with the uh, Sultan or the Agong's visit to China. Right, right. So uh, right. That, that's something I wanted to highlight. Also, as, a, as a, another point relating to Forest City as well, and also the Sultan's visit, I'm not sure whether you read, there was a story that was carried in Bloomberg, uh, and then also, uh, that was written by Bloomberg, uh, and then later carried in the Straits Times Singapore. One of the reasons why the Agong is visiting China is to ask for Chinese support and funding for the high-speed rail. Mm. Right? So, um, again, from an optics perspective, right? Uh, when this kind of news is uh, reported by Bloomberg, I'm sure they have their, their sources, you know, it may cause certain concerns uh, on the part of uh, an important stakeholder in this high-speed rail, right? So where do you think the concerns would be? Where do you think some of the concerns would come out from uh, if, let's say, uh, what Bloomberg has reported has some merit to it? If I take a wild guess... Hmm. The nearest to it, maybe Singapore side? <laughs> Why? Why do you think the Singapore side would be concerned? Uh, I think Singapore is a very careful nation. Mm. They have uh, tried to express themselves in much more neutral manner, definitely. Yep. And they're concerned of having their optics to look siding a certain party. Yeah, they don't want to yes. try to uh, you know, align with one party or another. Like yes, that. yes, yeah. Uh, However, nonetheless, to say that as well, I was just trying to put all this information that you were mentioning just now and reflecting a few of those things that recently I have come across. I think to a certain extent as well, Singapore, I do notice while officially they don't, they try to maintain a very neutral stand, mm. but I can see that like they are, seems like there were certain people who are of important position mm -hmm. are starting to speak up about like hey you know us um while well, we are not signing one party but maybe you're pushing it too hard you mm -hmm. know and this backfiring yeah yeah not yeah. so healthy like, right right yeah. I, if you notice that there are a lot of like these high-ranking people are starting to come and talk not as an official capacity but they are starting to go up to podcasts and everything and then they will mention this thing yeah and, and right? it is something that is of concern not just to Singapore but to Malaysia and other countries in Southeast Asia yeah, as well yeah that's right uh, but specifically on the HSR uh, I think because Singapore is uh, very concerned about the financial sustainability of such a project and also the transparency in which any contracts okay. with regards to the building of the tracks the rolling stock and all that mm -hmm. is, is awarded definitely news like this where uh, you know, uh, somebody like the, the, the Agong going to uh, China and reportedly uh, asking for financial assistance and backing from China uh, for this high-speed rail project would definitely, you know, raise uh, concerns about the transparency of the award, the financial sustainability of uh, such a project uh, on the Singapore side. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there'll be more developments on this. Uh, Anthony Lok has said that the government will make an official announcement on the high-speed rail uh, by the end of the year. Uh, whatever decision that is made, whatever announcement, uh, that's just Malaysia's own, Malaysia's position, the mm. government of Malaysia's position. The Singaporean side still has to respond. Yeah, that's right. Right? You know, usually what will happen is that there will have to be some sort of committee uh, that needs to be established uh, between the two countries to discuss the details mm. Uh, mm. of uh, any proposed HSR. Mm. But I think uh, the higher the chances uh, of such a project uh, being funded in ways may, that may not be financially uh, sustainable and also the war of the project may not be transparently mm. uh, done. Uh, I think the more concerns Singapore would have. I have two questions uh, before we end this session. The first question is that, uh, why do you say that it doesn't seem like it's financially sustainable? That'll be one. And number two is, it seems like now we are seeing a very full force pushing of this whole Forest City, SEZAG, SFZAG, no, it seems that more and more Zach is coming out, right? Yeah. All of these things to try to drive the economic development on Johor itself. Yeah. So where do you see Johor is going to be in, in the next two to three years, right? So on the, financially, uh, on the financially sustainable question, the government of Malaysia has come up to say, look, 
government is not going to put any money into this. It's going to be a private sector driven mm. initiative, right? Uh, and if let's say an investor from China is going to come in and say, look, we're willing to bankroll this, uh, I would ask immediately ask, what are the financial trade-offs. terms? Uh-huh. What are the trade offs, right? Uh, is it going to be some sort of a land sale? Is it going to be mm. some sort of a quid pro quo on something else? Right, right. Uh, because for the sake of argument, if this project is going to cost 100 billion, uh, there's no bank or network of banks that's going that's going to be willing to uh, fund this without some sort of a uh, government guarantee. Mm, mm. But if let's say that government guarantee is going to come from, let's say for the sake of argument, China, do you think Singapore would agree to such a setup? Ooh, right? So that that, that will require a lot of yes, discussion. Yes, yes, correct. That so require a lot of discussion. You know, those are the things that needs to be discussed uh, in the context of whatever joint committee that the both countries will have to set up to take this project forward. Right. Mm, so that's mm. why the, the the financing question becomes one that one is that that is very important. Right, right. I guess right. I guess the main concern there will be the 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 structure of it, right? Mm. Yeah, that would be the main focus, la. Yes, and how yeah. much one one side is going to put, the other side is going to put, and if let's say on our side it's going to be backed by, uh, you know, uh, another government, uh, what are the terms and conditions, and how right. may that affect the operational uh, sustainability uh, of the entire high speed rail? Mm. Right? If let's say it's got to be bailed out. Uh, then you know what is the uh, sort of like a bailout uh, terms and conditions on the part of the Malaysian government and possibly the Singapore government as well. Right. It sounds uh, like it sounds like building another highway, but a much more complicated uh, and uh, also involving another country. Yeah, three-way right. party okay. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So so that's that's one. Uh, that's to respond to the first question. The second uh, to respond to the second question, uh, I think that uh, you know the Madani government is trying to use Johor. Uh, as a showcase to see how they can deliver strong and above normal economic performance mm. and use this as a platform to not just win support and win votes in Johor itself, which is an important state for AMNO, but then use this economic narrative to say, if you give us another five years after the ne- uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the next general election, we can, de- we can you know, deliver the same kind of above normal economic growth in other areas ah, as well. Right. So oh, that, that's a good the, one. That's a good the one. economic uh, okay. you know, imperative that I think the Madani government is slowly uh, but surely developing. Mm, okay, the one I buy. Because yeah. uh, I think there's a huge amount of confidence that was given because of uh, the development of Penang. Mm. Then uh, definitely Selangor, you say, right? Mm. Yeah. And then if you can Johor. create the same thing in Johor, mm. it does give this uh, huge expectation in other states to say that, hey, yeah. yeah, support us another five years. You know, we'll bring the same kind of development to Pera, to Pahang, to Sabah, to Sra- uh, to Sarawak, and even to some of the uh, past dominated states in Kedah, in Trungganu, mm. in in uh, Kelantan. Right now, if if this story were to work, and it really truly does happen, then I do kind of see quite the relation of uh, having a HSR, having the East Coast Rail, and you know, all mm. those kind of things. It, it does play its part then. But the finances has to work, uh, and the process of negotiating. And putting all these plans in place also has got to uh, get the buy-in of the different stakeholders, mm. right? So, yeah. So, um, you know, we've gone on a little bit, uh, you know, in this uh, first segment. But I hope that has been instructive uh, in terms of giving you a little bit behind the scenes look on some of the events that have been happening in Johor. Uh, but uh, definitely, there'll be more things to say about the GSSEZ, especially when the leaders meet in December. Uh, early December, December 8th and 9th uh, is when PMX is going to meet with Lawrence Wong and that's when the uh, MOA, the Memorandum of Articles will be signed uh, on the GSSZ and that will be revealed to the public. I'm sure a lot more things to talk about after that. Okay, so be right back after this for the second segment of this episode. Welcome back to the second segment of the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policies in ways that are relevant to you. Peter, um, Mm -hmm. you know, even though I was in uh, Hong Kong over the weekend, uh, I did receive quite a lot of news on Sunday, the 22nd of (laughs) September, uh, about the DAP Penang state election results. Yes. Right. And uh, I think since we got such a high number of views uh, for that episode, uh, two episodes ago, 
uh, you know, talking about you know Charlie and some of the behind the scenes maneuverings. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you pay attention also to the results? I did not went in depth into it, but nonetheless, what happened is that when the results came out, it remind me that you owe us. Uh, some sort of behind the scene, and you're gonna continue on with the story. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that part of the story right now. Okay. <laughs> so from a big picture perspective, uh, I think that it is good for DAP Penang the results, uh, good for Penang as well in terms of uh, stability, continuity, and possibly a good transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of the chief minister position. Right. Uh, so uh, you know, just to remind our audience, uh, the. New DAP Penang chairman is none other than Stephen Sim, uh, the Minister of Human Resources, the MP for Bukit Matajam, and uh, the State Secretary uh, is also none other than Lim Hui Ying, uh, who is the Deputy uh, Finance uh, Minister and mm. also the sister to Lim Guan Ying, yep. uh, the chairman of the DAP. This uh, Sim Lim combination was one that was proposed by none, none other than the Secretary General of DAP, Anthony mm. Lok. Uh, before the elections uh, were known and uh, the results were known. And of course, uh, Anthony couldn't be there because he was accompanying yep. the king in China. Uh, and the fact that this combination ultimately was the one that was accepted by uh, the delegates and also the 15 uh, you know, state committee representatives that mm-hmm. were elected, I think uh, also bodes well for DAP Penang. La, yep. Right. Yep. So some stability there. And then probably from, you know, as an outsider, you look at this and say that, hey, uh, you know, Stephen Sim would be probably uh, in good position to, uh, you know, gain enough support to be the next chief minister of Penang. Yeah, and not just that as well. It gives this, uh, how to say, it, like in in from outside this optics, it would be while there's one limb there, mm. uh, the head of it is not a limb, mm. right? So what happened is that it gives this perception that you're also more willing to accept progressiveness and moving ahead because uh, Stephen Sim has always been this this YB that people see him as the more progressive side he is moving ahead you know mm. while not at the same well accepted by the Malay uh, well community well accepted by Malay community so I, I thought it was a very good choice personally uh, and then at the same time having uh, 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 Lim Hui Ying as the state as secretary. the state secretary it kind of also signals that uh, there is certain well relevant advisory based on the existing culture and how things were done so it kind of signals this very nice transition mm. that feels like it's not gonna go into this big fight and big uh, fight yeah and yes yeah like it, it, it almost feels like probably now you don't have to take sides mm-hmm. yeah, yeah that kind of feeling okay so before i take you behind the, the curtain i just want to clarify two points uh, one is that the top vote getter in this uh, dap Penang elections uh, was uh, Ram Kapal, mm. uh, who was uh, formerly deputy minister, uh, the 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 law ministry under the PMO. Yep. Uh, but he stepped down because you know his brother became the the minister, and he didn't want there to be uh, any accusations of nepotism within the DAP. La. So I think that was something that the party respected, uh, and he was put as the and he was given the most votes, so he was the top vote getter. Uh, and some people did ask, how come in DAP state elections, the person who got the most votes don't become the chairman, right? Mm. Because I think Stephen Sim came in number two or number three. The fact of the matter is that this is a system that is well accepted among the DAP and also among whoever is going to be elected into the top 15 uh, of the state committee. Mm. Whereby it is understood, it is more important for you to get consensus support within a majority of the top 15 than for you to emerge as the top vote getter. Yep. Right. Top vote getter simply means that you have maybe if there are two or three factions, you are acceptable to all factions mm. as a as a member of the state com. It doesn't mean that uh, you, you command the respect of that particular group to become of cha- state chairman. Yeah. Right. You command enough respect to be in the state com, but not necessarily yep. to become the state yep. uh, committee chairman. Same thing happened in uh, DAP Selangor as well because uh, you know Gobin wasn't the highest uh, vote getter. Right, but he was still put in as a DP, uh, you know, a Slango chairman mm, because mm. he had the support of all of the other state committee members. Mm. Right, so that's one clarification point, you know, as to why uh, in a system like DAP's uh, elections, we don't get, uh, we don't have a situation where the top vote getter becomes uh, the, the chairman. Mm. Uh, it, it's much more important to get majority support within the top fifteen. That's yep. one. The second thing is, uh, you know, and this was also tweeted out by uh, the admin for the Are We Okay. Uh, you know, Twitter account holder, 
you know, is this is there a is there a divide you know between the uh, Ying Sa or the English speaking leaders uh, within the DAP versus the Hua Sa, which mm. is the more Chinese speaking uh, leaders and also members within the DAP. Uh, and some people were speculating that oh, you know, there could have been this kind of factional uh, fighting. Uh, and of course, uh, Stephen Sim is not not uh, Chinese educated. Uh, he speaks very good Chinese now, just like how uh, Anthony Lok had to learn. You know, I also had to learn when I was an MP. Uh, you know, because I'm not uh, Chinese educated. Uh, but we learn. All of us learn to communicate in Mandarin at least. Uh, and of course, when being in Penang, you definitely speak good Hokkien. Uh, so you know, uh, he Stephen may have been you know seen as in the Ying Sao, the uh, English educated mm. group. But uh, you know that is actually not the case. Uh, the 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 allegiances uh, within the uh, DAP Penang don't really go along this kind of uh, very simplified Ying Sa or Hua Sa. So it's not a language faction. It's not a language faction. More to do with if there was any sort of like division uh, within uh, DAP Penang, it would be whether or not you are seen as a original DAP Penang leader or not. Oh, Meaning okay. Whether you are seen as uh, Ori Penang, that means. You you have been Penang for a long time. Or born or there, born well there. accepted there, yes. or air dropped in there. Correct, correct, right. correct. So if there was any division, that would probably be one that is more important. Right, right, right. So maybe it should be Tisa Kong Sa, you know, ah. uh, the ground one or the air drop in. Ah, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> either Tisa, you're you're sort of like rooted there, or you're like parachuted there, <laughs> like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be relevant to our to our subsequent discussion. So I just wanted to get those two things out of the way. So with with that being said, let me take you behind the curtain now. Ah. Uh, okay. So uh, some of the things that maybe you know you may ha- not have noticed if you didn't go into the election results in detail, uh, which is the fact that even though uh, Lim Hui Ying, who was uh, appointed uh, as uh, state secretary, you know managed to get into the top top fifteen, her vote was relatively low. Mm. So you know Stephen Sim or Ram Kapal, they had about thousand three hundred votes uh, out of uh, you know the total uh, you know delegates. But Hui Ying had only about 800 votes. Mm-hmm. So it's a big difference, 500 vote difference. Right. right. So uh, many people, uh, probably including myself, interpret that as there being some branches and some leaders who withheld support from Hui Ying as a sign of protest uh, against familial politics in Penang. Mm. Yeah, they may not have liked how maybe some family members uh, within the, the Lim clan uh, was trying to orchestrate things uh, so that only people who were loyal to the Lim clan, 110%, were put into the top 15. Right. Yeah. So that can actually be seen as a sign of protest. That's just one, one example. Another example, which again, even analysts haven't talked about this, but I'll, again, I want to draw you behind the curtain. One of the ex-co members uh, in Penang, who's a state assembly man, uh, you know, called Wong Hon Wai, uh, former MP uh, for Bukit Bendera, very nice guy. I've you know, uh, shared some uh, discussions with him when he was a member of parliament. I was still in parliament. Uh, he's a member of the ex-co. He was somebody that was touted to be a possible replacement for chief minister. Oh, behind wow. the scenes, like, okay. behind the scenes. Okay. Uh, and there were some people who were speculating. Uh, that certain powers that be within Penang wanted to put Hon Wai in as chief minister even before Chao Kon Yao uh, you know, could retire gracefully at the end of his five years. That means within the next few months or within the next uh, uh, half a year or so, topple Chao and put in Hon Wai to be the new chief minister. Okay. This is just speculation. You know, uh, this is what was told to me by certain people uh, whom shall, re- shall remain nameless because I don't want to get them in trouble. Uh, and it is quite unique for uh, an ex-co member who seems to have the backing of you know, uh, certain people and, and quite um, uh, you know, somebody who's quite loyal to the Lim family, not to even get elected into the top 15. He wasn't even elected into the oh. state comp. Mm. Okay. Which tells me that, again, there is uh, this kind of quiet protest happening within certain leaders uh, and also members in DAP Penang to say that we do not want to support the maneuverings of dynastic politics. Mm. Uh, so this is something again new uh, and uh, something to take note of uh, whether or not uh, this kind of trend continues maybe even to the national right. level. W- would you then say that uh, the fact that Ram Kapal chose to not 
you know, uh, take on a position, right, was kind of like also a signal in that sense like, look, familiar politics is something that we don't want to be a part of. So therefore, uh, I want to also... <sighs> so I, I think for Ram Kappa, people gave him the respect because he voluntarily took a step back right. at the federal level so that his brother could become mm, a minister. Mm. Right? I think people respect that. And um, <clears throat> in terms of, let's say, respect for uh, Ram and even maybe the, the Kappa family, I think that kind of respect is still there. Mm. Right? But there are qualifications that are certain uh, sharat, if you, if you were to put in. Right, to put right. in. Because at the same time as Ram got the highest votes, Again, this is something that not many people have spoken about. His brother, Jack Deep, who is also the Deputy Chief Minister of Penang, was not elected into the top 15, right? So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that I think should be taken note of because if let's say you think that, okay, la, I know uh, Chao Konjo as Chief Minister is not contesting, if you support the DAP state government, uh, at the very least, you would try to support or vote in the Deputy, Deputy Chief Minister right? into the top 15, right? To... To ensure that you know at least a senior member of the uh, government is still in the state committee, right? But mm. he wasn't even put in the top fifteen, right? And this is where again behind the scenes I have to be careful here because I don't want to get uh, in, in into any uh, legal trouble or whatever. Uh, but I suspect this has got to do uh, with the fact that most people in Penang knows, and also the DAP members know that there was a reason why. Jack Deep decided to take emergency leave or, or, or sort of like medical leave uh, for about two weeks. And this was announced in public, you know, because generally speaking, right, if let's say you had to go on medical leave, you don't necessarily need to announce it in public. But yeah. for him, uh, that was announced in public by the chief minister, right? So the, the, the DAP leaders, the DAP members, even a lot of the, ch the chattering classes knows uh, in Penang uh, that uh, Jack Deep's effectiveness as as uh, exco and also deputy chief minister uh, has been affected i think uh, by issues to do with the reason why he had to take the medical uh, or emergency leave right and this is a way for the leaders and the members to say that we know that everyone knows about this issue uh, but yet at the same time the dap leadership is not dealing with this from a sort of like uh, action perspective Right, so so you can see some of these uh, interesting dynamics happening, right? In the sense that the the members and the leaders are quite um, independent minded, right? They are not listening to uh, you know uh, purely dynastic politics. They are rebelling against it in some ways. Uh, at the same time, they still value the people who do contribute. Let's say within the Kappa family, mm. but with conditions. One like Ram Kappa, where who has seen to be you know sacrificed himself for the sake of the party at the national level, is given the highest number of votes. But right. Jack Deep, not even in the top 15 because of the reasons I talked about. And mm. I think it's very unique in Malaysia because if it's in any other uh, country where I think uh, the press was uh, you know, playing a more, I think, a check and balance role, the, the press would have reported, I think, on the reasons why uh, Jack Deep had to take this medical leave or emergency leave. Right, mm. right, right. So, yeah. so now, now, now that you put it this way, right, uh, things has become a little bit more complicated again and de <laughs> develop a little bit further. Correct, right? correct, uh, correct. So not, not so, not <coughs> so. The big, big picture is that uh, Sim Lim peace, uh, good for the party and all that. I, I think that is still true, uh, but there are some of these other permutations and combinations that I think needs to be addressed by the DAP leadership within Penang and also at the national level. Uh, before the next state elections. Right, right. So so it's kind of like, it, it started off with, let's say there's uh, two factions, right? Um, randomly just putting it out there and mm. yeah, let me know whether my understanding is correct. Mm. So originally the idea was that there's a party A, party B, uh, these two are kind of like opposing. Uh, but subsequently, when we develop this story as we move ahead, the development that we saw is that people are also saying that, well, we don't kite one party A or party B, we want a C. Mm. kind of thing and or then maybe like, we want the party A and party B yeah, to, to join work together, together. So but we on our terms yeah on our terms so we show you what we think a C looks like mm. so now suddenly it's like uh, okay okay yeah, yeah. so what the C looks like is you know Stephen Sim at the top uh, Hui Ying playing uh, the role of state secretary which uh, I've seen her in action before she plays that role very well she's a very good organiser she knows how to mobilise the branches mm. for mm. Uh, you know different uh, reasons and whatnot. Uh, you know of course her 
a performance as a as a federal deputy minister, that's a separate question, lah. But in so far as state secretary responsibility, she she does it very well, right? Right. right? But but then you know there are also others, right? Uh, Ram Kapal now is the deputy chairman. Uh, you know, Azariel uh, Kier Johari is still playing a prominent role in right, in right. in the 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 party hierarchy there. Right. Uh, and then you have others who maybe are seen to be uh, more firmly ensconced in the dynastic politics camp for different reasons. Maybe because of performance. Maybe because they are seen to be you know not so playing a not so value added role in the longer longer run. Then they are not even voted into the mm, top fifteen, mm, right? Mm. So. These are all the dynamics that will probably send signal to other people uh, in the DAP in other states because the CEC elections is happening next year, yeah. right? So to what extent are uh, some of the some of these vulnerabilities will they be also exposed similarly exposed uh, in the next uh, CEC elections? Yeah. Right? So and it kind of like shows this like like look at the end of the day I don't want to bother about whatever issue I'm dealing. I just want people who can do well in this role to be at this place with yes. certain consideration. Yes. And and that, that's how it seems like it has turned out to be. More or less, yes. That's, uh, I think, uh, a very good way of uh, summing it up uh, mm. in the context of DAP. Penalty. So I have to say that the system actually has its way to make it quite efficient. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So they find their own equilibrium, which I think... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bodes well for the party moving forward. Yeah. And surprisingly, it wasn't the one that was shouted out. You get I me? Mean? It kind of like just what? fell in place almost. It was hinted at by Anthony Lok when he proposed the same limb combination, right? And things sort of like fell in place uh, after a lot of behind the scenes kind of uh, well, lobbying. I, I'm and starting discussion. to feel that the master strategist at the back is quite very wise in mm. terms of knowing how to uh, adjust. La. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and, and this whole thing was when kind of like unnoticed. Uh, to a certain extent. Yes, because, uh, you know, the, the good thing about the DAP uh, is that uh, a lot of these things are not spoken about publicly. Oh. Right? Uh, and I think, you know, there are a few reasons why I choose this podcast to speak about it publicly. Uh, firstly, there's the educational role uh, to let you know uh, some of the internal workings of a political party, which I, I still uh, am part of, uh, which I think still works, uh, you know, relatively well, uh, you know, uh, by and large. Um, that's the education part. But there's also another part which is uh, also one thing to share that uh, there needs to be better accountability structures mm. within the party. This is the one that I think uh, maybe is not so good because like we've said in the past episode, you know, some leaders in DAP Penang has openly rebelled and uh, uh, weakened uh, the ability of the chief minister who is from DAP to do his job. Right, uh, and not much action has been taken. Mm. Right, uh, the bigger question is actually, you know, what's going to happen to the party because of the actions of certain individuals. Right, right. You may have a exco that is not performing because of certain reasons that's well known in the public, uh, in Penang, uh, but you know, no, no action is taken to to uh, you know uh, have uh, remedial measures uh, with right. regards to this. So those are things that I think, for the sake of transparency. Uh, and leading to performance also should be, I think, discussed in public. Mm. Not to say we want to we want to add dirty linen in public, but we want to add more transparency so that there can be more accountability of certain leaders, uh, especially when they hold important uh, positions of prominence. Mm. And and that's something that I think uh, has been quite consistent in my sharing here in the podcast. Right, uh, I I try to be sensitive to. Uh, you know the positions of these leaders, uh, and even now, you know, I I haven't said why I think one particular leader, uh, you know, was not voted in uh, because of certain problems. You know, even though everyone in Penang knows what that problem is, uh, you know, I re re respect respectful of that. But the party leadership needs to uh, do something about it in their own way, in their own time. And I'm just uh, merely highlighting this so that the larger public knows about these issue issues. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions about DAP Penang uh, before we close the chapter on this one? And I'm sure you guys will also comment a lot on this. Uh, I think it just gives me this thought, kind of reflection kind of thing as I'm looking at all this. I think while, while a lot of the strategy has played out to kind of fall, fall in place, right? But to a certain extent, they need to be addressed on a certain point. Certain things has to be addressed and mm -hmm. dealt with. Mm -hmm. So, it feels more like a band aid at this point. Yes, yes. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a dealing of root cause. So the 
problem is still going to be there. But we know that the problem is rather systematic and rather big and complicated and blah, blah, blah. But I guess if the party want to continue to be at its top, there's a lot of things that need to be done because when I read through the comments on our side here, I and and even other channels generally when it comes to this kind of topic, you can see that there's a growing dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction, right? Mm. right? Yes. Yeah, there's this growing dissatisfaction. Yes, and a lot of people are starting to say that if you don't do something, we don't vote for you anymore. You know, stuff like that. And and I I just feel rather sad about that. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, um, I I think. The those issues would hopefully be uh, you know resolved slowly but surely moving towards the next general and state elections. There's no guarantee that it would be, but I think the signs are uh, more on the positive side, mm. especially after the state elections. Yep. Uh, and I just want to end this segment, uh, you know, responding to one proposal uh, that was made by uh, Kyrie uh, in his uh, Klaus Kejap podcast, where he said. Uh, imagine a situation where you could have uh, Stephen Sim as the federal minister, maybe even taking over Anthony Lok uh, when Anthony Lok's three terms expires uh, as Secretary General of the DAP. And then possibly possibly Zairiel K. Johari as the Chief Minister of uh, Penang. Mm, right? mm. So you know, he sees this as a very uh, you know, potent combination. Uh, I yep. will agree with him uh, you know, with regards to that uh, combination. Uh, but uh, knowing some of the uh, thinking behind uh, DAP leaders in Penang and also members, I think it would not be easy uh, for DAP Penang uh, to propose a non-Chinese chief minister for the state. I don't think we are ready for that. Actually, uh, I would even take that even further. Okay. In the next one decade or two, right? Mm. Zario can be Sakjan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, you say that you get me in trouble, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know whether you should cut this uh, off. Yeah, yeah. But so, so uh, let's say from your perspective. Okay, why, from my yeah. perspective, let me tell you why, right? Okay, okay. I'm not going to be in politics, I'll just put it up mm. front, right? Uh, I'm happy to sit here in my happy podcast chair. <laughs> uh, uh. Why I think so is because I think for far too long, the perception of DAP among, among the grassroots yeah. is that it's a Chinese party. But when you put up someone who's a non Chinese up there, number one, you are telling and signaling to the whole Malaysia that it is not a race-based party. Mm. It's truly a party about idealism mm. of what we believe Malaysia can be. Mm. And while at the same time, we uphold the principles of the constitution. Mm. So, I think that's extremely, extremely, extremely powerful. Mm. Like, like, you put that up, right? N nothing to fuck anymore, you know, suddenly. Like, mm. like, like what are you going to attack someone? Mm. What much harder on to earth attack, are you gonna attack someone? Much harder to attack the AP that's for right. being a you know anti-Islam or anti malaysian That's party, right. Like. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm. So if let's say ultimately every time Sekjen and uh, and the other people, you know, it's, it's a multi-racial mm. leadership group. Mm. It becomes very 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 strong mm. in my opinion. Okay. So uh. you heard it here first. Uh, Peter is suggesting uh, Zairiel K Johari to. Uh, be the future Secretary <laughs> General of the AP. Uh, I will reserve my comments on that. Uh, I will only stick to what I said uh, earlier. So, keyboard warrior comment, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not quite keyboard warrior. You, I think, have your own standing already. Uh, but I think, uh, on my part, uh, I would still say that the AP Penang is probably not ready at this point in time for a non-Chinese Chief Minister that would be proposed by them. Uh, trends in Penang may change and are changing over time. Uh, the population of Penang uh, is becoming more Malay majority uh, and that will be reflected in the voting uh, statistics and the yep. voter composition uh, relatively soon, especially with automatic registration. So just keep that in mind and then uh, we'll uh, stop this segment for now. Be right back with the third segment of the Are We OK podcast. Welcome back to the third segment of the Are We OK podcast where we're going to touch on a very sensitive topic, but I think we're going to address it from a different angle, hopefully. Yep, uh, this yep. is with regards to the uh, scandal involving Global Ikwan Sindrian Berhad or GISB uh, for short. Uh, and you know, for those who may not be aware, this issue has blown up uh, over the past Crazy. couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, uh, the focus is primarily on alleged uh, abuse of kids by you know, members of this group, this, uh, you know, entity, this corporation, uh, including at the highest levels. Uh, and some people have been arrested and charged, assets have been frozen, and then that's also led to uh, investigations into the corporate activities of GISB. That's right. Uh, 
uh, whereby you know the the inspector general of police was reported to have said that you know they haven't been paying their taxes and mm. uh, they are involved in different kinds of you know commercial activities That's and right. whatnot lah. So I I actually want to focus on the reaction to this whole scandal rather mm. than go into the details of the scandal itself mm-hmm, because mm-hmm, it's still being investigated. Mm-hmm. And I want to start off by just focusing on the response by the non-muslim community right so there have been some shows you know including by you know uh, this uh, duo that i respect quite a lot from uh, bbk yep. you know, uh, and uh, i think bbk lucas and others yep. uh, you know have done a great job in terms That's of right. uh, you know promoting podcasts this is through a chinese medium and uh, then they have done two shows on this as al- already uh, and you know you just look through some of the comments uh, and from my reading of this uh, it is i think a coming together of different elements which gives reason for the non malay community especially the chinese community to pick apart uh, some of the you know activities of gisb and to also reflect i think their own concerns and their own ha- unhappiness about how the government is may or may not be responding to uh, this particular issue and i'll explain why lah i'll explain why uh, i i think the focus among the non muslim community is that a you see This one, an example of a uh, Islamic group that maybe has uh, deviant thinking or deviant ways of doing things that has been allowed to operate maybe even above the radar for such a long time, mm. uh, and the government didn't do anything about it. Mm. Right now, it has blown up in your face, huh? So, haha, you, you know, you you uh, you maybe you deserve it or something like that. Mm. That's one. Second thing is uh, the reaction of the non some non Malays uh, would be. Hey, last time you have this uh, Akmal Saleh, past youth chief, uh, you know, coming out to say want to boycott the KK Mart because of the uh, you know the the word uh, Allah on the socks. Now, when it comes to you know something like this, which is probably far more consequential, because yep. you know kids have been alleged to have been abused. Uh, yep. There's a criminal, uh, you know, misconduct in terms of the handling of the finances, yeah. right? So where's Akmal Saleh? How come he doesn't come out to, uh, you know, condemn, boycott X, Y, and Z? And then the third thing would be uh, to try to link this somehow to past leaders and say, hey, these guys, you know, maybe they are linked to past this kind of extremism and uh, funny things that they are doing, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe past is also part and parcel of this, uh, you know, uh, nexus of uh, illegal activities, mm. right? So a lot of this kind of negative speculation and commentary. Uh, that may not necessarily be directed towards GISB itself, although if let's say these allegations are true, you know they they deserve this and even more, uh, but a reflection of the uh, larger unhappiness among the non-Muslim community about how uh, you know in their minds when it comes to Islamic matters, some of these groups are treated in a different way compared to uh, you know. Uh, non-Muslim corporations yeah. or others. I think generally uh, we have to say that there are certain group of uh, non-Muslim people who thinks in this way. So maybe I'll, I'll give my own share of my thought mm. on this matter. Certainly, for the community that I'm in, and generally my circle in my channel and everything all, and the kind of channels that uh, I'm involved in uh, on social media side, what I can see a lot of it is that whether whether Muslim non-Muslim alike generally are very Angry against this whole incident mm. as the incident itself, yep. right? They did not really bring in too much about the religion aspect, mm. right? Uh, in the English-speaking community, urban especially, less of it, less of it, yeah. Uh, and many people very quickly also discovered uh, by many news channel talking about it as a sect in the Islamic religion, mm. and for many people who are. I guess simply because, like, uh, for for some of this group, they are a little bit more educated or more well exposed. Mm. Not educated, but more well exposed. They understand what a sect means, right? Which means there is a deviant group of yep. a particular teaching, and so because I myself being a Christian, we also see a lot of uh, deviant groups, sects, and so on. Where yep. sometimes they also do weird weird stuff. So I can also understand from a Muslim perspective, they don't feel good about it, and therefore. They while they are totally against it, they don't want to keep talking about it. Mm, it's like washing dirty linen in public. Ah, it's like washing mm. dirty linen in public. And for me to explain to you the whole thing, also it takes very long, mm. right? So might as well just don't talk about it. But am I against it? I am against it. Mm. Uh, I guess to a certain extent, that's what we, in my opinion, I think I'm seeing 
that kind of response coming from uh, the Muslim community, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, and I can totally understand why. Uh, there are also people who speak up, like for example, uh, uh, Dr. Mazza. Dr. Uh, Mazza, yes, right, who uh, spoke up and. Yes, uh, Mufti uh, in, uh, in Police, uh, and he has called them out before, you know. Uh, that's right, that's right. And I, and I thought that was a very good one. Mm. I think the people who responded in that way, like that we talked about just now, mm. to say that, like, there's this whole, like, oh, why like that? You know, uh, is it just because it's a Muslim community, then you all treat them differently? Mm. And then is it linked to past? I personally feel like it's very uncalled for. Mm. And it also shows that they're not too exposed. Mm. They don't quite get what it really means. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that was necessary. Lah. Yeah, and I think it shows the, um, you know, more concerning uh, underlying divisions within our society uh, when it comes to religion. When you talk about this sensitive topic, it's almost as if you are talking to different groups of people, right? Mm. Uh, coming from different angles. And I think... Uh, it is something where we need more mature and more honest and open uh, discussion, but in an educated way, so that we can get people who actually know uh, enough about the situation to come and uh, expose us. Lah, mm. right? Whether it's from the non-Muslim perspective or from the Muslim perspective, uh, maybe somebody who has been in uh, a cult before, uh, you know, uh, in a sort of like Muslim cult before and can tell us you know, about these kinds of uh, challenges. And like what you said, this is not something that is only uh, specific to Muslim cults. Yeah. Right? We hear so much and probably we read about even more uh, Christian cults yeah. uh, because you know, they are very active in the That's US. Right, yeah. There's even Buddhism cult as yes, well. Buddhism right? cults, yeah. where, where also as, cults, right? As long as there's no proper governance structure, no check and balance, no proper accountability structures, there will be these kinds of abuses. Mm, right? It can right. be abuses against children. It can be abuses against uh, women. Uh, you know, it can be this kind of sexual abuse. It can also be abuse of finances. Mm. Usually these things happen together. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and uh, I, I think uh, this is part and parcel of how uh, we should try to uh, approach these kinds of issues uh, on a more uh, rational perspective, mm. which is what we try to encourage uh, in this podcast. Mm. Uh, and I hope that uh, other podcasts can also mm. play uh, that role of uh, uh, shining light in a responsible uh, manner and having, uh, you know, I think an open discussion and discourse. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and and I wanted to uh, just put a little bit of thoughts into this, right? When they commented about Akma, right? Actually, my opinion, right? I thought he was very smart. Mm, okay. Uh, I, I don't know, but I thought it was a smart political move. For him yeah. not to comment. Yes, for him not to comment. Okay. Because if I were to put myself in the community of the Muslim community, if he starts coming out and he just needs to say something wrong, right? The perception would have been, hey, bro, can you don't air our dirty laundry? Mm -hmm. That's how it would be portrayed as. But yes, he could have actually just picked up and said that, you know, this is a, we as a Muslim community, we we go against such practices. Nah, we don't uh, we, we don't believe in such. Uh, yeah, like that, yeah, this kind of thing. And then they would have put him in a slightly more neutral spot suddenly, right? Yeah, and he would have gained some political bounty points mm. even among uh, non-Muslim communities. Yep. Yeah, so I would say that like um, it's a good maneuver but could be better. Lah. And I think that could have been something that he could have done within the context of maybe we talk about it uh, you know, shortly here. The upcoming by-elections in uh, Makota, mm. in Kluang. Right? By the time you hear this, the results will be out. Uh, you know, I, I predict that it will be a very comfortable uh, victory for the BN uh, because when they won this seat in the 2022 state elections uh, at the beginning of January, it was in the context of three-corner fight. Now with PH, especially DAP, supporting the BN candidate, I think there will be more non-Malay support. Mm. Uh, but also, there have been people who are saying that, hey, non-Malay turnout may not be very high because people are not happy with Akmal. And that's why Akmal has not played a very prominent role in this particular by-election. <laughs> right? So that could have been you know, an uh, opportunity for him to come out uh, to maybe position himself in a more neutral way, like you say. Yeah. Uh, maybe he would have done so by the time you listen to this podcast. Uh, but definitely, I think it shows... Uh, that in the consciousness of the non-Malay community, he has definitely taken on this persona. Mm, uh, and definitely not like in a positive way. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I think I'm not convinced by is whether or not he has gained the persona of being a Malay hero in the eyes of the Malay community. Right? <laughs> that one I think is a little bit more divided. Uh, because, yeah, that was also quite divided. Um, you, know, you don't necessarily gain the respect of the majority of the Malay community by playing this kind of very openly racist and racial uh, card uh, to the extent that people can see that 
it's like blackon lah. Mm. Right, it's a big act that you're playing. You're trying to play the big tough guy. That's right. That's right. Of course, his physical attribute also allows him to do so. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think that's something to to uh, you know to highlight. Uh, and also, I, wa- I wanted to highlight this as well. Even among pass, uh, there are different reactions. Uh, you know, when uh, w- when asked about this, the pass secretary general Takayudin Has- Hassan, the MP for Kota Baru, a lawyer by training, said that yes, you should take appropriate action, but don't go overboard. Right, I'm not sure what he means by "don't go mm, overboard" mm. Uh, because there are, you know, pretty serious allegations here. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, uh, open reports to say that some of these people uh, that has who have been detained, uh, they may continue to be detained under SOSMA, uh, one of the laws that, uh, you know, uh, PH actually objected to when we were in the opposition. So that's quite likely, you know, going to be something that could be undertaken. Uh, maybe this is the overboard thing that Takuyudin was referring to. I'm not quite sure. And then also the past information chief has used this uh, GISB issue to attack Anwar, to say that hey, how come in the past we've seen some photos of Anwar together with some of these GISB leaders, mm. right? So you can also see you know the kind of politics that's being played among certain past leaders, uh, but I think most have chosen to be uh, relatively quiet on this uh, issue uh, because I think uh, you know it, it is a huge issue uh, that will have uh, continued to have leaks yeah. because it encompasses so many different. Areas where the police will have a field day, the attorney general will have a field day in terms of prosecuting Correct. different individuals. Yeah, I f- I feel like actually to a certain extent, I feel like this this particular case, uh, in detail, is going to be hard to comment. It's going to be very dangerous to comment because um, being being a media person for quite a while right now, right, I I tend to notice this one thing, and sometimes you you know they say the 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 river that that doesn't still water. What was that? Aisanan jangan sangka tiada buaya. Uh, and surprisingly, this case, right, uh. is such a big case outside. Uh, here, uh, the kind of statements that are given, it, it could be blown up even further. But mm. there seems to be some sort of a containment. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. like like a lot of details are not being revealed, mm. a lot of containment, and then a lot of things just keep past. But but even know, the details that have been revealed, they are scandalous enough already. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so so it it just feels like. There's something more going on with this whole thing, you know. Yes. Yeah, and and honestly, when the first time I heard this, uh, I was actually very angry. Yeah, because I got I got kids, ah. Uh. Yeah. So then when I hear these kind of things, ah, uh, it just uh, yo, makes me really angry. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure this issue will continue. Uh, not sure how much more we're going to comment on it in the future, but just wanted to flag it up because it is an important issue that's got to do with public policy from the perspective of uh, accountability and and governance. Uh, within uh, different institutions, including private ones like GISB, uh, and also the government response, uh, and also the responses of uh, political parties and politicians uh, to this, lah. Uh, so yeah, I'll be right back with the final segment of the Are We Okay podcast for this episode. Welcome back to the final segment of this Are We Okay podcast, uh, and uh, we've gone into a lot of things. The last one is just a very very short one. You know, I read in the news uh, recently, and it's good news, a uh, good way to end this program, I, I I suppose, which is announcement that Petronas, together with uh, Petros, which is the Sarawak government's uh, energy arm, trying to resolve their discussions uh, in an amicable manner and uh, to disagree with a news that was published that says or speculated that Petronas was going to take the Sarawak state government to court mm. uh, over disagreements about how the revenue was going to be uh, shared uh, on some of the uh, gas uh, supplies and also gas business uh, in Sarawak. Currently, it's run by Petronas. La, right? So that is good news for a number of reasons. Firstly, we're talking about billions of ringgit here that could have an impact not just on Petronas, uh, but also on the government finances. La. Yep. Uh, because Petronas is, you know, contributes one third of uh, government revenues through uh, direct and indirect taxes, uh, and also good news. It's also good news, you know. I think for uh, the Sarawak state government, in the sense that I think, uh, you know, if it goes to the courts, then a lot of things will come out, you know, in public, which may not be so uh, good, uh, and even may not be so good news for the Sarawak state government because it may affect investor confidence. That's right. Right. So the fact that they are able to you know, at least publicly announced that they will resolve this outside the courts. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts uh, to to share about this? I personally think that it kind of shows these signs that the federal government side, uh, I mean, in a way represented, right, uh, by Petronas. 
and Petros. It kind of shows this whole effort to actually really trying to be one country together and mm-hmm. to have this common shared interest. So I, I would say that's, that's, that's actually a very, very good start. Lah. I mean, although ultimately it's still the question about how things are going to be settled and what's the moving forward ahead kind of thing. And in, in your perspective, I'm not sure how in-depth are you in this whole thing, right? What is the best way of moving forward? Because when we actually look at Sabah and Sarawak, both as a state, mm. they do have a lot of natural resources. Sure. And uh, very often we are saying that their natural resources are either underutilized or either is not being, f- the revenue from it is not very fairly distributed in that sense, right? Um, do you think that there needs to be some sort of an enhancement of policy or uh, working around it? And if they are, what would there be? Uh, I think I always look for win-win solutions. Uh, and the direction that the Sarawak state government is uh, moving towards is to build internal capacity within the state uh, for different kinds of economic activities. So Petros was set up so that they could have an equivalent of Petronas within the state. Uh, you hire the right people, a lot of them are from Shell or Petronas with that kind of experience uh, to build up um, you know, those capabilities, uh, not just uh, from uh, sort of like uh, you know, oil and gas uh, you know, business perspective, but also in the finance uh, area, uh, in the area of uh, you know building downstream businesses, uh, and uh, that is something that perhaps Petronas can work together with Petros uh, to resolve. Mm. Uh, of course, money is still money. Uh, you know, uh, that is always a point of contention in terms of who gets what based on what terms, mm. uh, and it's something that has cost former Petronas CEOs uh, their jobs before, uh, Tan Sri Wan Zul uh, being the notable example, uh, because that was when Muhyiddin was the Prime Minister. He felt that he had to stand the ground on certain issues with regards to revenue sharing, uh, and he lost that battle, and I, I think he had to, uh, he made the decision uh, of not continuing. Mm. Uh, you know, so I think the, the current CEO probably uh, has uh, learned from that episode and is trying to find a more palatable way of, uh, you know, finding a win-win situation. Mm, mm. So that's good. But similar issues have not really been addressed uh, with regards to other states. So for example, uh, you know, this issue of uh, Wang Esan and getting the petroleum royalties for Trunganu, for example. Mm, mm. Right? Uh, and I was just reading uh, uh, you know, Tommy Thomas's uh, you know, memoirs uh, over the weekend. Uh, and he was actually an advisor to the uh, state governments of, uh, past state governments of Kelantan and Trunganu where they took a case against the federal government uh, to claim back some of these mo- monies. Uh, ultimately, he was asked to drop those lawsuits, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, when uh, PASS was part of the uh, PN federal government. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're going to restart those lawsuits, uh, you know, now that they are in the federal opposition again. Uh, so, you know, those are issues that I think need to have a bit more clarity la. Mm. Uh, because as long as there's no uh, transparent way of uh, allocating these revenues uh, there will be uh, you know cases where the state government will still be unhappy yeah that's right so uh, I often find that this problem between state and federal right uh, always come in in such a manner where it is that like when I don't like you then I do something about it to go and dig out past problems mm. right but when I like you it's okay let's you know, but there don't seem to be a very strong political will, except this time round when Abang Joe was around, is around, mm. that to actually really establish certain policies to make sure things are very transparent. Mm. I think to point out another part of it is like uh, there are certain illegal activities, and uh, for example, even let's we talk about timber, right, and all these kind of things, right? Um, there's not being addressed. No one talks about it. It's almost an open secret that something is going on. Uh, even mining of certain minerals. I mean, stuff that literally that Google satellite can see <laughs> on uh, is not being addressed at the root level. And it's just allowed to just, well, close one eye. So, and all this, if you properly regulate it, it would drive revenue towards the state. And I see a huge part of it is, you, you know, it's just yeah. unspoken. So then it's allowed to be just... Not bothered. Yep. So a couple of responses to this, lah, since we're talking about state-federal relations. It's not an easy balancing act for the state. And I'll point to certain examples, focusing on Sabah and Sarawak. Sarawak, for example, is a, Sabah and Sarawak are both big palm oil producers. Sabah is uh, the yep. largest in Malaysia, actually. And for 
the big players that have plantations in Sabah and Sarawak, you're talking about, you know, the, the IOIs, the KLKs, the Saim Dabis, they are RSPO certified. So whatever activities that takes place within their plantations, they, uh, you know, have those kinds of uh, very high world-class standards in terms mm. of uh, land disputes, uh, in terms of environmental standards and all that kind of stuff, mm. right? But you have a lot of smaller plantations uh, that, you know, at most they have MSP or Malaysian uh, Sustainable Palm Oil Certification. Uh, many smallholders in Sabah and Sarawak actually don't have those certification. Mm. Uh, and then they sell to, you know, the palm oil processors in those states that uh, will then sell the palm oil to, uh, you know, uh, people uh, to, to, to people in China and also to India where the certification standards are not so high. That means they are not asking to buy MSPO or RSPO certified uh, palm oil, right? Uh, you know, CPO and things like that. So um, uh, that is something that I think is one of those open secrets that you were referring to. Uh, can the federal government do something about it? Um, tricky because uh, the state government would respond by saying that, hey, if you want us to be MSPO certified, you need to pay our smallholders, which the federal government uh, has been trying to do already. Uh, but there are also other activities that some of the state agencies, uh, like the you know, like some of the Sarawak Palm Oil state companies are uh, involved in, that may not reach these uh, MSPO or RSPO standards. Mm. Same thing when you talk about uh, timber. Uh, you know, we have something called the uh, uh, Forest uh, Stewardship Council, FSC uh, standards, where a lot of the timber that's exported to places like uh, Japan and, and, and yeah, the European Union, uh, they, they have these kinds of uh, high FSC certification standards. Uh, but there are also timber that's being exported out from both Peninsula and probably a lot from uh, Sabah and, and, and definitely Sarawak in the past that don't have to adhere to these kinds of high standards. Right, so the Sarawak state government would say, hey, if you want us to ad adhere to these standards, you have to compensate for us for it. Mm. Right, so I think this is the kind of uh, uh, discussions that the federal and the state government should be undertaking. Yeah. Uh, but as far as I can see, you know, they are more focused on some of the performative aspects of uh, negotiating without necessarily knowing what, what is the outcomes that uh, both sides want to have. La, for, for example, some of these ongoing MA63 discussions. Mm. Right? So my, my perspective of it, when I just look at it, just a final thought on my part is, sometimes I tend to look at all these kind of things a little bit kind of like, um, I'll just use a whole different industry just to give a bit of an idea of my thoughts. Uh, like gambling, right? The gaming industry, mm. right? Um, there's the regulated side, where the moon is regulated, it has license involved or anything. And yeah, whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. The point is that at least generates revenue to the nation. Yes. Whether yes. it's in the form of tax, you know, whatever not. Because let's be honest, it's still gonna happen. The right? you're talking about the illegal part? Ah, the illegal part, okay, yeah. right? Then there's the, the other part that uh they do not want to be legalized. Because mm. uh it is well known well known fact that it is much more profitable to do illegal gambling than legal gambling. Yes. Yeah, the pay. money is way bigger. Because you don't have to pay taxes. That's right. They're not regulated. Yes. Mm. No, uh, sometimes, not just in our country, but we say the overall as a structural thing, I tend to notice that very often, it seems like when certain things are not regulated, it just gives a lot more hand in... Illegal activities. In like, uh, yeah. Maybe not illegal, but maybe it gives a lot more hand into certain private players to okay. protect their own interests. Okay. So, so you're saying that this happens more in Sabah and Sarawak? Uh, I, I I wouldn't say that. Yeah, okay. I, I would say that. I think generally we see national, uh, internationally as well. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to be very careful with what I say as well. Yeah, it, it seems like there's no there's lack of the will to really get it regulated mm -hmm. when it is actually rather straightforward. Yeah, but yeah. you know maybe yeah, we, we can end on this. Uh, you know, apart from gambling, uh, there's also two other industries which the prevalence of illegal activities, I think is much higher in Sabah than Sarawak, and in Sabah and Sarawak compared to Peninsula, which is illicit tobacco and Ill illicit alcohol. Mm. Right, so it's very, very common. Oh, you yeah. go to Sabah or Sarawak, you can buy, <laughs> uh, you know, six pack of beer for like, uh, you know, uh, cheaper than mineral water. That's right, that's right. right. So a lot yeah. of this is soy for, they call it underwater, right, yeah. and funny brands all over the place, and, and cigarettes are obviously... Uh, you know, in that in that category mm. as well. But to address those issues, you need to address the problem of uh, illegal smuggling, mm. right? That that is that is that exists here in Peninsula, 
but probably it's more rampant in Sabah and Sarawak because of the different entry points that they have from uh, the Philippines, from uh, from uh, from uh, you know Indonesia, and even maybe some from you know Vietnam or you know because it's the, the the borders are actually much porous over there. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I I think you know if let's say we really want to have a discussion on trying to resolve these kind of federal state issues, uh, let's put more things on the table and then see how to resolve them. Uh, slowly and systematically. Mm. So, do you think one day Malaysia will be able to resolve uh, at least more of these things? Uh, if there's political will, uh, if let's say we want to focus on more transparency and better governance and take away some of the more emotional or emotive aspects of discussing federal state relations, I think we can get there, but it will be a slow process. Right. Yeah. So, thanks for all your sub support. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe so that we can reach. 30,000 subscribers hopefully by the end of this year and we can uh, continue to provide you with uh, good content and bring in more special guests to the Are We Okay podcast. See you next week.